Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jennifer Wilkes and I have the privilege of serving as director of the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies here at the University of Texas at Austin. Let us begin by acknowledging that those of us in North America are on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, I would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Caro, Carizo Come Crudo, Kualuitecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan Apache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. Today's gathering would not have been possible without the energy and enthusiasm of Warfield Center Senior Program Coordinator, Christina Bryant, and IUPRA Associate Director, Dr. Danielle Wright. Please join me in thanking them both. And now to the main event. We are so honored at the Warfield Center to partner with our friends and colleagues in the Institute for Urban Research Policy Research and Analysis, or IUPRA, to celebrate the publication of Making Black Lives Matter, Confronting Anti-Black Racism, edited and introduced by Dr. Kevin Coakley and featuring important contributions from activists, scholars, and students. Such an event would always be timely, but it is even more so today, which would have been Sandra Bland's 35th birthday and which comes just under one week after the fatal shooting of Amir Locke in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The work included in Making Black Lives Matter helps us to contextualize such tragedies, to process them, and to work towards societies in which black lives can indeed flourish. We'll begin with an introduction by Dr. Copley, Chair of UT's Department of Educational Psychology and Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Educational Psychology, also immediate past director of IUPRA. He'll be followed by three of the volume's contrib contributors, Annika Olson, IUPRA's Assistant Director of Policy Research, Dr. Tracy Lowe, Dean of Student Success Research at Dallas College, and Ricardo Lowe, IUPRA's Research Associate and Demographer. They'll join Dr. Danielle Wright for a brief moderated conversation after their remarks, after which the floor will be opened for general discussion. Please share your questions via the Warfield Center's Padlet site, which you can access via the link in chat. And you're also welcome to drop your questions directly into the chat. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Coakley to the virtual stage. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wilkes. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. And hopefully you are not seeing my notes and you're just seeing a slide. I have that problem sometimes. So I wanna thank the Warfield Center for extending an opportunity um, to us for being able to um, really have an important conversation um, around the publication of this book. And as Dr. Wilkes mentioned, um, it remains a, a timely event given the recent uh, happenings over the past week or so. Uh, again, um, Dr. Kevin Coakley, um, and I am a proud um, former director of IUPRA. Um, I spent the past eight years or so of my life um, directing this wonderful um, institute uh, with outstanding staff. I, I, I've told them that I miss them terribly, and um, it's so nice to see their, their warm and smiling faces. And I wanted to start this sort of um, talk by giving you a little bit of context. So back, uh, I guess, you know, in, in 2020, um, our former IUPRA postdoctoral fellow um, and current assistant professor of African American studies, Dr. Kiana Ross wrote a powerful op-ed in the New York Times um, where she talked about the tremendous suffering and death that was being faced by African-Americans. 
Now, she argued that the term racism, which you know is certainly a useful term, did not fully capture what black people were experiencing. And she argued that the right term to use was in fact anti-blackness, uh, which is the disdain, the disgust, and the disregard that people have for the existence of black people. Uh, this op-ed, as you might imagine, um, sparked a number of um, important conversations and it really serves as the backdrop to um, the publication of this book. So I just wanted to give um, Dr. Ross a, a shout out. Now, what was the motivation behind this book? Well, there were a few things. Um, again, the idea was born in the summer of 2020. We all um, remember very vividly uh, the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the, the uproar, the, the protest that that sparked not just in this country, but worldwide. Um, it really reminded us uh, that race still matters and, and, and especially so for black folks in this country dealing with um, the police. And so I was contacted by Cognella Publisher um, because they wanted to make a difference by leveraging what they do best. And so they, being a, a publisher that is very committed to uh, highlighting and underscoring voices of, of people who have not always been margin have been highlighted. Um, they wanted to figure out a way that they could use and leverage their publishing industry to, to bring attention to what was going on in this country. And so they contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in putting together an edited volume of, of various voices within Black communities. And this was something that very much interested me. And it really is especially interested me um, because they wanted to publish a free ebook um, that would again highlight these important themes and voices in black communities and and I don't know about you but it is rare um, I have found it to be very rare that you would have a publisher that is motivated not by profit but by social justice but by wanting to do something good in this world and so the idea that this would be a book that would be disseminated freely um, really resonated with me. The, the dissemination of knowledge to those who, who need it and who want it, but who may not always um, be able to access it, um, is very important to me. Um, and it is very consistent with the public scholarship that I've engaged in over the past few years. And so that certainly was an important um, um, sort of motivation for putting this book together. Now, what are some of uh, the features of this book? Well, the book focuses on the ways that anti-Black racism manifests and has been confronted across various domains of Black life. Um, and, and what you should keep in mind is, is that this is not a traditional academic book. Um, you, know, you know, fortunately, I'm already a full professor. I don't, you know, have to, you know, publish books uh, to get promoted anymore. But, but this is not a traditional academic book and it was not written as such. Um, it really was a way to highlight people who might not otherwise be able to have their voices heard. This book does not privilege any form of knowledge or way of knowing over another. Um, in the academy, we sometimes um, find ourselves really only listening to people that we deem to be experts based on their pedigree, based on their academic credentials. Um, but in this book, you know, we take the approach that knowledge comes not only by way of education, but by lived experience. And we wanted to make sure that that was uh, emphasized in this book. So community and student voices have the same authority as voices of traditional academic scholars. That was very important to me. And, and again, the publishers gave me carte blanche to do whatever I wanted to do with the book. I was only limited by my imagination. Now, I'm not the most imaginative person, um, but being able to think about what I really could do with this book uh, was very exciting to me. And so the book incorporates diverse approaches for confronting anti-Black racism um, using research, using 
activism, um, using social media and therapy. I, I am a psychologist and I wanted to make sure that therapists were also highlighted. And it provides recommendations and solutions to challenging anti-Black racism in all of its various expressions. And what makes this particular offering, this book, you know, different than others that exist? Well, currently, you know, there are a number of Black Lives Matter related books um, and, and, and they're all very good and fine books and I would encourage you to, to buy them all and to read them all. Um, they, they tend to be traditional single authored um, books, uh, monographs, uh, which tell a story about Black Lives Matter from one perspective. And that perspective of, of, you know, of course is very important. Um, but I happen to believe that no one person can tell the whole story of Black Lives Matter. We have a tremendous amount of diversity um, in our communities. And, and we want, and I believe it's important that we try to um, give voice and space to those different perspectives um, within, within our various communities. And so this book represents a diversity of voices, um, including scholars, again, including practitioners, including activists and, and students. And you know, when I, as I sort of thought about this, I, I realized that some people might look at that list and think that I'm creating sort of false categories. Um, and I wanna be clear that I'm not doing that. Scholars, especially in the African and African diaspora studies department, uh, many scholars are activists. Activists can be scholars. Uh, students can be activists and scholars and practice, you know, so I want to make sure that I, people don't read this as me creating these sort of false categories. Um, these categories obviously overlap, um, but I wanted to make sure that a diversity of voices was really reflected in the book. And if you've had an opportunity to, to read the book or read portions of the book, one of the things that you'll note is that several of the chapters are written in your traditional scholarly prose, the ways in which many of us uh, were trained in the academy um, and supported by the requisite research and citations. And you'll also find that some of the chapters are written from the positionality of the contributors based on their lives and on their professional work experiences. Uh, and again, this was really important to me. We don't you know, when, you, when you're talking to an activist who's on the ground, who's doing the work, they're not going to be able to necessarily cite for you references um, that those of us who are in the academy are able to do, nor should they have to be able to. That's not, who, that's not their calling. That's not what they bring to, to the struggle. And so I, I, I'm excited about the fact that the chapters are written in different voices, um, using different approaches in communicating um, very important information for, for all involved. So, so what are the contents of the book? Um, so I, as I thought about the book, I, I knew that there were certain sections that were absolutely essential. And I wanted to make sure that there was a section that focused on activism. And, in, and this is what um, really um, starts the book. And so in this, this section of the book, um, you see four chapters. Um, one focuses on the historical overview of the Black struggle. I think any book of this nature should, should center and ground the book in history. And so this chapter does that. Um, there's a chapter on facilitating Black survival and the wellness through scholar activism. Uh, and again, this was someone from um, psychology who is very much a scholar activist, so much so that she made the lead author so much so that she made the, I think, difficult decision to leave her tenure track position at a very prestigious public institution uh, because she found it stifling to her activism and found it difficult to maintain a sense of integrity and to stay within the academy. So this person not only um, walks the walk, she not, not only talks the talk, but she walks the walk. Um, we had a, have a chapter using social media to confront anti-Blackness and to promote social justice. Um, it was very clear to me that in this current historical moment, social media is incredibly important. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to, to hear from those um, who use social media very uh, creatively and very effectively um, to fight anti-Blackness. And of course, it goes without saying that there had to be a chapter 
on hashtag say her name um, because we know that without the efforts of, of black women, uh, we would not be here. And so we, we were able to find a very, um, um, very strong scholar whose work um, you know, is around gendered racial microaggressions, gendered racism um, to write this chapter. The second section of the book um, um, focuses on public policy, policy. That's why we are here uh, today. Um, there are four chapters um, in this section. The first focuses on segregation and anti-Black education policy. Um, the second one focuses on global inequities in policing and carceral punishment. Um, the next chapter focuses on homelessness among Black young people. And the fourth uh, chapter in this section focuses on anti-Blackness and housing inequality. And of course, this falls right within the wheelhouse of IUPRA. And so when um, I was um, conceptualizing the book, I knew that there had to be a, a section on public policy. And I knew that the brilliant minds of IUPRA needed to be involved, um, given that that's the work that that we do, and I still find myself saying we because I will always be a part of the Institute, um, the work that um, that we do. And so I wanted to make sure um, that we highlighted that important work. In the third section, um, and this was really particularly novel from my vantage point, I wanted to highlight community voices. And, and so we have four chapters here. Uh, the first chapter focuses on um, the Austin Justice Coalition and the work that they do. Um, they chatter, the chapter's entitled Community-Led Justice in Austin, Texas. Um, when you read the chapter, you, you will find yourself very familiar. For those of you who are um, updated about um, the, the activism that's going on um, locally, you'll, be, you'll, you'll find yourself very familiar with um, much of what's being reported in this chapter. Um, the next chapter is Using Education to Confront Anti-Blackness. Uh, this chapter is, is particularly exciting to me, being someone who does a lot of research um, on education, uh, because it highlights a school, the Texas Empowerment Academy, that not too many people, I think, are familiar with, and yet the work that's being done there is extraordinary, and we need to be familiar with it. Um, the next chapter is Traditional Healing for Contemporary Times, um, a chapter written by a psychologist based uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia. And in this chapter, she she talks about her unique IFA inspired um, therapeutic work and how she focuses her work um, on Black women and 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 really sort of helping Black women to heal. And then finally, um, in this the um, fourth chapter, fourth um, contribution to this section, addressing Black men in a time of turmoil. This chapter was written by. Um, a black male psychologist, again, based here in Austin, uh, who used to work in a counseling center and who's in much of his practice um, focuses on black men. And so I wanted to hear from him as he reports the stressors that he has encountered um, in working with black men and how they navigate this terrible, this very stressful space um, that we find ourselves living in. And then finally, the, the, the last uh, part, of, forgive me, I see a typo here. This should say student voices. Um, but I wanted to hear from the students themselves. Uh, students and, and, their, and what they report is their experiences of anti-Blackness in education. And so the first chapter here, Black graduate students' response to academic and social anti-Blackness. Um, and this is a, a general overview of the challenges that black students um, experience. I have a chapter, um, to be young, gifted, and black. I am especially proud of this chapter because this chapter was written by our undergraduate students here at UT, many of whom um, or, or black studies majors or minors, but they were absolutely brilliant in what they were able to share about their experiences um, in the education system and how it impacted their sense of self as black people. Um, you definitely want to make sure you check that chapter out. And then finally, there is a, uh, the chapter on the anti-black experience of graduate school. And this chapter is, is especially personal for me because the contributors of this chapter ended up leaving their graduate program, and one of whom came to work with me um, because of the anti-blackness she experienced in her graduate program. So 
these are um, the chapters um, that make up this book. And we are very fortunate to be able to hear from some of the contributors. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Annika Olson. Thank you so much, Dr. Coakley, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I think this is going to be a great discussion. I'll dive right in uh, so we stay good on time. The chapter that I wrote was entitled A Tale of Three Cities, Segregation and Anti-Black Education Policy in Los Angeles, Chicago, and Austin. So I really wanted to discuss the history of Black students in the education system in America, highlighting racial disparities and also touching on things like poverty, food insecurity and the digital divide. But I wanted to highlight how all of this was happening in three cities to show real world examples and how universal this anti-Black sentiment was and in many ways still is a part of the education system today. So I chose LA, Chicago and Austin. And in the first section diving into LA, I really discuss 1960s segregation, forcing black students into certain areas of the city into certain schools, followed up by the 1976 state Supreme Court ruling, which uh, was gonna use busing to desegregate schools, and then really diving into the white flight that occurred in the 70s. And to me, that's, that's anti-blackness in action. That's the desire of white folks not to live near people of color. And there's a lot of empirical evidence to support this. So fast forward then to 2015 and to, and to today, LA is still see, deeply segregated. South LA, Inglewood, Compton versus the you know, Brentwoods, Bel Air and Pacific Palisades, still a deeply segregated city and especially within their educational system. The second piece discusses Chicago. In 1960s, there was overcrowding in Chicago public schools and the Department of Justice found that Chicago public schools was guilty of unlawful segregation based on race. Again, fast forward to the present day. In 2017 to 2000, 2007, excuse me, 2017, Chicago public schools lost more than 52,000 Black students. So things are just as segregated as they were in 1960, right? The 70 percent in 1960, 70 percent of Black communities lived in areas that were Black, and in 2011, that's 63 percent. In 1960 in Chicago, the poverty rate for African Americans was 30 percent and it is now 34%. So that, you know, that theme is kind of running through the cities of that segregation and that anti-Blackness that has occurred you know, 50, 60 years ago to the present day. So lastly, I discuss Austin, starting with the Master Plan of 1928, which uh, purposefully wrote into law the relegation of Black and Hispanic communities to East Austin and the disinvestment in Black communities for decades. So like the other cities, they decided on two-way busing, but in 1980, a judge found that two-way busing did not satisfy Brown versus Board of Education. So Austin, 26 years after the momentous Brown versus Board decision was fully integrated. However, despite that, in 2022, um, we still see that segregation exists throughout Austin schools and throughout Texas, throughout the rest of the country. But in Austin especially, that's a lot of the work I've done with Ricky and Tracy at IUPRA. Um, we still see a lot of segregation in the Austin school system. So similar themes running throughout each of the cities. And then lastly in the chapter, I dive into policy recommendations. I think some of those policy recommendations include, you know, confronting anti-Blackness in schools, right? And having educators and leaders make it a point to discuss and unearth these issues. Um, requiring African-American curriculum in schools and addressing the sanitized history that is often taught in those spaces. And then, you know, supporting students and really making it a point to celebrate Black excellence and achievement. And another piece that I go into, which is a little bit harder potentially, is, is white parents. How do we go in and change the minds of white parents? Because generally, white parents have power and control over where they send their children to school. And I, I think it's time to really look critically um, at education policies being promoted or diminished by white parents and, and tackle the issues that have uphold that have upheld um, white power in schools. Um, one way to do that is potentially outlaw private schools. I discussed that a little bit um, because they're predominantly high income and white. Um, but and some of these, you know, none of these policies are, are perfect and would even be, you know, kind of in the realm of possibilities. But I, I really think it is important to to discuss those to discuss those recommendations. So that's a little bit about my chapter. Um, happy to answer questions and I am gonna hand it over to Dr. Tracy Lowe. 
Thank you, Annika. Um, so hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My chapter was on anti-Blackness and housing inequality in the United States, the history of housing discrimination in major metropolitan cities. So Annika and I did a lot of uh, co-writing together <laughs> when we were developing these chapters. So my chapter is kind of laid out in the same framework. And that was mainly to help everyone understand how these housing discrimination policies, they were present all over the nation. So in different major metropolitan cities and across time. Because as you'll notice today, a lot of the things that I talk about still exist, are still in effect and still have impact. So the chapter starts with Chicago, Illinois, and it spans from the 1900s to the 1950s. And I really talk about how this was a period after Reconstruction um, when Southern states had started to establish these Jim Crow laws. And so these laws and statutes that legalized segregation and discrimination were making it very, a very um, tumultuous period for African-Americans in the South. And so this spurs the great migration from the early 1900s to the mid 1970s, where you have over 6 million African-Americans who are relocating from the rural South to the North, Midwest and the West. And so of course, when you have an influx of residents uh, into these areas that were predominantly white, these anti-Black stereotypes of Black people is dangerous, unsafe, unsanitary, and uncouth start to emerge in these specific areas of Chicago. And so this is when we have a lot of these areas, policymakers and folks really starting to try to figure out, well, how do we concentrate these Black residents, this Black population outside the proximity of whites and whiteness? And this is where we start in the policy realm to get into these zoning laws that are established to provide to prohibit African Americans from buying homes in these areas um, on predominantly white blacks and vice versa. So you have these first zoning laws that started in 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland. And then in Chicago, um, you have them, they actually start to adopt what we call these racial deed restrictions and restrictive covenants during World War I. So that's 1914 and 1918. And so what these racial restrictive covenants did was there were basically these packs or these compacts that are entered into by a group of property owners and real estate agents. So you have property owners and real estate in cahoots with each other, basically trying to make it so that black residents are not able to move into these neighborhoods. So in a given neighborhood, they've agreed to not rent, to not sell, to not lease, or otherwise convey their property to colored people for this definite period of time, unless all agree to the transaction. And as you can imagine, everybody's not gonna agree to a transaction to let black people into their neighborhoods. So what's interesting, and Annika did a piece on this, so if you all check out the IUPA website, there's a lot of great information that she provided. These restrictive covenants actually still exist on the books and are in property deeds. So a lot of people may not know, but when they look into their property deed, their real estate documents, this hurtful language is still in there. And even though it's not enforceable today, this is still documented as kind of a reminder of the intentional and systematic segregation that lives in the, in, in the still lives in the soul of our real estate. It still lives in the soul of like everything that has to do with housing. Um, and I'm pretty sure there may be some black homeowners that have this language still in their deeds. And it's hard to remove. So it's not like it's something that you can go and say, hey, but there's a lot of different processes you have to go to remove this language from these property deeds. So as these black populations continue to grow in Chicago, there's limited space for them, which increases uh, black ghettos and contributes to these worsening living conditions for black neighborhoods. And this just wasn't happening in just Chicago. It was happening in other cities across the nation. So you have several organizations, same as today, such as CORE, the Congress of Racial Equity and National Association for the Advancement of Color People, working to counteract these racial covenants in the courts. And so even today, and during the civil rights movement, and along the period and spectrum of time, fighting policies and fighting this discrimination and fighting this anti-Blackness in the courts has been one of the key features or the key tactics to dismantling uh, these systematic barriers that have basically shut Black people out of education, out of housing, and a lot of different areas. So the next part of the chapter goes into Los Angeles, California. So this is another city where we have a lot happening in the housing world. 
Um, and I start this chapter off in the Great Depression because that was a, a really um, important period for American history because it spurred some of the worst economic downturn for Americans. And so you have millions unemployed and a lot of folks who cannot pay off balloon payments, they can't make their mortgages. And so, you know, how, how is the nation government gonna step in and, and help out with this specific situation? So under the new deal with President Roosevelt, um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation was established. And so the purpose of this corporation was to help with emergency lending and to create what we know as amortized loans or amortized loans with longer repayment terms. So it's basically the loans that you see in housing today where it's 15 to 20 years and it creates these equal payments um, each month on the loan. And so even though this program was meant to bring benefits to a lot of Americans, and it did help a lot of Americans be able to pay off their homes and pay off their homes faster and kind of get back on track, there is a catch-22 to a lot of things as still with policy now, there's always a catch-22. You have the benefits for some, but there are sometimes consequences for others. And so when the concept of redlining comes up, it is often associated, associated with the HOLC. So in 1935, they created this city survey program, and it's just to gather data on the nation's real estate and mortgage problems. And so this program creates what they call these residential security maps. And what ends up happening with these maps is they emerge from the data that's collected by the appraisers, but they base it on this code system. So you have green is grade A for best, blue grade B for still desirable and yellow for grade C, definitely declining. And then you have red for grade D, which is hazardous. And as you can imagine, what neighborhoods were primarily in the grade D or hazardous areas? And it tended to be black and brown populations. And so this process came to be known as redlining because again, these black and brown neighborhoods were predominantly in these hazardous areas that were coded as red. And there were a lot of implications for this because the color, and, and Dr. Michelle Dickerson states this in her book, the color of the homeowner's skin was a central factor in the rating system and race was used to determine whether a neighborhood was safe or desirable. So in this particular case, this anti-blackness was the key to determining whether a neighborhood was safe or desirable. And so it impacted everything from maintenance, the ability to get loans for, for home purchases, um, and a lot of these black neighborhoods and still to this day were zoned in industrial places and located close to commercial waste treatment centers. So if you think about the Flint water crisis right now, when you have them pulling in water from the Flint River um, where there's an adequate treatment and testing that was happening in 214 and the results, of course, they say that there are high levels of lead that are really impacting the children in the area. So these, these systems and policies that were in action back in the 1930s, 50s, and in the past are still operating and impacting very much today. And so again, talking about slums and clearance, uh, we have a lot of these cities that have specific areas that they're demolishing what they call slums in order to create highways. An example, when we think about Austin and the divide of I-35 and how it solidifies the divide between black and white neighborhoods in the past and still has racial implications. So a lot of this stuff, again, is still happening. And then the chapter moves into the Lone Star State. So we have Texas. So in the 1980s, you have oil prices that have plunged. Black people are leaving the inner cities to, get it, to go into the neighborhoods that white people flee to in the suburbs. And so there's a lot of different things that are happening when you talk to the Lone Star State from the 1950s to present. Um, and this kind of spurs what happens with the Black middle class population, which me and Ricky do a lot of work on. But as you start to see this white flight to these suburban, suburban neighborhoods, and now today, it's almost as if there is um, impact from that white flight because these say, if you think about DeSoto, Lancaster, and, da and Cedar Hill in Dallas, you have some kind of reverse, reverse migration of Black people coming from northern cities into southern cities, and now they're taking refuge in these suburban spaces that white people have fled from in the past. And so, again, the effects of discrimination, the chapter talks about that, Black middle class remains more likely to live in lower income neighborhoods, are concentrated in poverty areas than other low income whites, um, residential segregation still continues, especially in areas where the HOLC gave these hazardous grades to neighborhoods. 
there are effects on employment opportunities, earning and mortality rates, the impact on the home value appreciation in black neighborhoods. Because there have been real life stories of how where you set up the house for one way and one race and say it's a white pictures everywhere and the house gets appraised at a higher rate than say if there are pictures of a black family in there. So again, this chapter is really just to kind of highlight how these anti-discrimination policies, anti-black sentiments really impacted housing across major cities. It's still happening and it just kind of moves through different periods but takes you through a story of what was happening in each of these different areas. So that's just a few highlights from my chapter. And again, I hope you read it and enjoy it. And if you have questions and want to do more research, I hope it really spurs that um, for you. So I will pass it on to Ricardo Lowe, no relation for everyone who is on the call. <laughs> All right, Ricky. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, and I will try to make this concise and informative as my uh, colleagues have. I'm known to talk a lot, so I try to make this super brief. So I'm kind of glad that I'm last for that. But um, yeah, so my name is Ricardo and I, my chapter is about policing the black diaspora. Um, and so essentially what I want to do or what I did in this chapter is detail the extent to which uh, colonial histories and global inequities in policing it's not just something that we see within the borders of the United States, but it's something that we see all across the world. And uh, I just wanted to delve into that a little bit. Um, so essentially what I did when I started the chapter, I ran into this really interesting quote by uh, Associate Justice Clarence Thomas. And uh, he actually said this in 1994, um, but it's just something that is continued to just annoy people, especially me. Um, he had this idea of individual responsibility, which is this conservative talking point, right? That you know minorities and poor people are not exempt from accountability. They're capable of dignity and as well as shame. And uh, criminal law loses sight of its importance if we don't take into account individual responsibility. So he's pretty much saying that people should be individually responsible for their actions. And um, if they commit a crime, they should serve the repercussions for those actions. Um, but when I, the way I contextualized that is I thought that that was a really lazy way of, to be honest, just a lazy way of uh, getting into this discussion because it absolves the role that the system plays in imposing barriers on certain groups and uh, just thinking about the contextual factors that exist that place people on the trajectory towards crime and punishment is super important. So as you heard Tracy and Annika state earlier, you have these contextual factors like school segregation, um, you have housing and discrimination and restrictive covenants, you even have mass incarceration. These are all arguments that have been used to go against this individual responsibility trope that Clarence Thomas said in 1994 and that conservatives continue to bring about in discourse today. But I wanted to approach this particular chapter in a different way. I wanted to talk about the the, the, the fact that it's not a coincidence that Black people in America are not only subjugated to uh, you know, unfavorable outcomes when it comes to policing and incarceration, but I really want to prove to the extent that this is really a systemic issue that is happening globally. And so we can't say it's individually responsible or it's a, it's a problem with individual responsibility if we see that this is a systemic issue that not only happens here, but it happens in other spaces as well. So for example, if you look into Australian statistics, Aboriginal people who mostly identify as Black, they're Indigenous people to Australia. Um, for the men, they're 14.7 times more likely to be in prison than non-Indigenous men. And for women, they're 21.2 times more likely to be in prison than non-Indigenous women, right? You look into places like Brazil, in Brazil, 79% of the Black people who were killed by police officers in 2020 were black people. So that's 79%, right? Um, and so what, what is it that leads us to this, to this same outcome that is happening in the United States and it's also happening in spaces like Australia and in France and Brazil? That was the goal of this chapter really is to bring it all together and just talk about the interconnectivity of what it means to police black people uh, across the world. And I think we saw that in 2020 when we saw the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there was 
millions of people marching the streets all over the United States. In fact, one estimate says there was about 26 million Americans who rallied the streets in support of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And this is during the pandemic, mind you, right? This is when COVID-19 is really just like, you know, it's, 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 it's getting crazy, right? So we, we have this pandemic going on and people are risking their lives to protest. Um, and we see this is happening across the United States. But the thing that stuck out to me the most was that there were 60 different countries that observed the same type of protests as the Black Lives uh, Matter movement in the United States. Um, and a lot of these protests were happening in spaces all over the world, like Brazil. Again, there was a kid named, uh, and I hope I pronounced his name right, but his name was Jao Pedro Matos Pinto. He was a black teenager who was shot in the back via rifle by a police officer in his neighborhood favela. So he was one of the 79% of the black uh, people who were killed by police officers in Brazil that very year. There was also an instance in France where uh, a black immigrant family and there was an activist by the name of Asa, Tra I, I don't know how to say her name as well, but Traori, I believe, she had a brother who died very similarly to George Floyd four years prior. And he's, he ended up saying the, the, the same words that he couldn't breathe in his native tongue, right? And so again, we see that these issues that happen in the United States is just not restricted to US borders. They're happening all across the world. And so when people are deciding to come out of their house and protest during the pandemic and uh, galvanize other people within the community, they're doing so because there's this empathy that is associated with it. It's not just sympathy saying, oh, we, we feel for you, but we are also going through the same thing as well. Um, and so, and we also saw that with the NSARS movement in Nigeria as well. There was a lot of activists who were talking about the issues that were happening in Nigeria. Um, and so essentially I came across a quote that really pushed me towards um, thinking about why this was. And it was by the former president of Liberia. Her name is Ellen John Johnson Sirleaf. And she said that, you know, what happened in 2020 uh, was everybody coming to a recognition, self-recognition of everyone's collective past. And so the question that this chapter really asks is, what is this collective past? Like, what exactly does she mean when we say that Black people across the world are coming into this recognition of our collective past? Um, and so I delved into those coll that collective past, and here's where I feel like I might be talking too much, so I'm gonna try to just <laughs> talk a little bit about what I found with this collective past situation. Um, but essentially what I mean is that when you had when you had uh, black people brought into the new world, initially you had indigenous people who served as the slave labor for um, the Spaniards and the Portuguese. And there were several codes that were put into place to regulate uh, that slave labor and to also give indigenous people's rights. But as soon as the indigenous population started to decline, pretty much due to ethnocide, you started to see that there, used, there was a, substitute, a substitution of that labor with black slaves. And so when they were bringing black people over, uh, of course, there was a lot of rebellion. There was a lot of uprisings that were happening. And this is not something that the Europeans were necessarily used to prior to racial slavery, right? Um, they had to find ways of incorporating codes to create this law and order and maintain uh, order and tame people. And so they created all these different types of codes. One of the codes that were first, that was codified in 1522 was a code uh, called the Provision del Vire Diego Colon, and it was considered the first Black code of colonial America. And it resulted in this colonial police force that, as I said, was monitoring slaves and prohibiting them from moving freely across the colony. And there were several codes that were created. It wasn't just the Spaniards and the Portuguese, but the French as well. They had this code noir that they brought over, um, and that was put into place to retain order among slaves and to keep them from maneuvering and moving all across uh, the plantation. But the one that I really wanna talk about was the Barbadian Slave Code. And the reason I wanna talk about this one is because this one was explicitly um, used to really punish slaves, uh, to police slaves. And it was something that the British used across several of their colonies. So they brought this Barbadian Slave Code in 1661 over to Jamaica. And it also came into South Carolina. Because remember, South Carolina was one of the colonies of the British. And when they brought this uh, slave code into this space, there are some historians who believe that this is one of the major slave codes that motivated and inspired the creation of modern day policing, especially in the South, because it helped to uh, result in slave patrols 
uh, in, in the southern region. So when people say that slave patrols come uh, are pretty much representative of modern day policing, uh, there is evidence to suggest that according to some historians. And so that, bar that, that slave code that was brought to Barbados ended up coming into South Carolina and inspiring the way that people thought about policing um, in, in contemporary in, in today's time. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the colonial effects of policing. So we also saw this in, 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 in slave societies, but if you look into Nigeria and Ghana, for example, which were colonies of the British, you saw that there were um, colonial practices in which uh, you would have uh, policing units who would train inside of the metropole. So if, for example, you would, you would train to become a police officer in England. And then after you graduated, you might be sent over to one of the colonies so that you can actually do your policing work. Um, and so in, in some of those instances, they would also hire local recruits. And the local recruits that usually where they were extracted from rural areas and brought into the urban centers to do the policing. Now, this is important because when people talk about the racialization of policing, they often say, well, Nigeria is full of Black people and they got Black people who are policing and Jamaica is full of Black people and they got Black people who are policing as well. How do you explain those disparities? And so the racialization is not ex exclusively about Black police officers and Black civilians, but it's also within the structure of policing itself. So the structure of policing and the way that it was created was as a way to bring people and to recruit them onto this, uh, this practice and for this practice to continue to be enforced in the name of colonial practice. And so that kind of helps us understand why we see some of these spaces in predominantly Black countries that have these traces of colonial uh, relationships and they continue to practice policing in the same way that you see in the United States or some of the metropoles uh, today. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of here and I don't wanna to talk too much longer, but I guess if we were talking a little bit about solutions or whatnot, there has been a, a conversation about reform and abolition. And this is just not a conversation that is happening in the United States, but it's happening everywhere. Reform looks different uh, depending on what side of the fence you're on. For a lot of police units, they're thinking about ways of uh, trying to do policing in a more equitable manner. So there's been talks about community policing. This has been done in Brazil, uh, but it wasn't sustainable. It was done for about a period, I think, of four to five years but with the change of the political structure, it was removed. Um, we also have ideas of reform that might not correspond with what we think of as reform. So there was a case of an officer in Springfield, Massachusetts, who was once in the military, who said that the best way to do policing was to incorporate paramilitary tactics that he did when he was in the military uh, and deployed in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So to put some policing units, that might be a, seen as reform, but to activists, that's not what they interpret as reform. Um, and then another thing is um, a lot of activists are saying, well, some of them are talking about completely abolishing the police system and others are talking about working towards the eventual um, disregard uh, or need for police. So let's work towards um, finding ways to reduce the need for policing in spaces where we can use something else so we see this in spaces like, uh, I believe, I think it was Norway where they actually incorporated a peace officer corps where they are unarmed and they're trained to talk down um, um, people as opposed to coming to these spaces with guns and try to de-escalate situations or whatnot. And that might not be an end goal for some abolitionists, but it's something that helps to lead toward the eventual need to just remove policing altogether. So um, I'll wrap it up there, and um, that's pretty much what my chapter was about. Thank you, Ricky, and thank you, Dr. Copley and Annika and Dean Lowe. Um, really appreciate you all sharing more about um, the work that you've done and the contributions you made to this particular uh, book chapter, the edited series. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. I see some people are already dropping in the chat. But I also um, want to say that having had the, the privilege really of 
reading through your chapters as you were developing them and then kind of looking at the overall um, experience of the book, there are a couple of key areas that, that really stood out for me. Um, and so I'm gonna just point some of those out and then kind of open up the questions, particularly for you, Dr. Copley, but also all of you all um, as contributors, feel free to, to chime in. So one of the, the things I'm hearing, this is really coming off of what you said, Ricky, but I think everyone has, has touched on this and Dr. Copley, certainly we've had these conversations. And as the first is that, you know, anti-Blackness is real. It's not this mistake. It's not this kind of oops moment. It's not a, you know, an issue of individual, a few bad people doing something and then, you know, getting punished, but it's a real structural, political, social, economic bearing um, that really relates to Blacks, not only in the United States, but around the world. And so I love that as I've been, you know, kind of taking a second look um, at the chapter that it seems like each of you are contributing to this real statement about not only the fact that anti-Blackness exists, but what is it? And so I think it's telling and it's really important that Dr. Copley started, you know, this discussion by helping you all understand, you know, where does, where does this term come from? Um, I know that so many people don't really know the language to put around the experience that we're having. And so I think um, that has been particularly important. And so in a minute, um, Dr. Coakley and team, I'm gonna let you all talk a little bit more about this notion of anti-Blackness. But I also wanna say, you know, it, we know that it's structural, but it, it, the thing that I think really stands out for me, especially because I have a young one and I'm watching the differences between age groups, how we respond to this, you know, is that, you know, this issue of anti-Blackness is really meant to disrupt Black people mentally, right? So our emotions, our health, um, and certainly, as Dr. Copley would tell you because of his background, the psychological impact, right, of what, not only what it means to be Black from the, the standpoint of Black people, but what does it mean to be Black from non-Black people who have something to gain, right, from economic, physical, housing, experience, oppression. And so to that um, end, I think it's really important for those of you all who are going to either have read the book or continue to read the book, to really be thinking about um, the way that Black Lives Matters as an edited book series contributes and gives you a different voice, right? Another place to come in and really pivot, um, particularly because you know, we've, we're now in a space where when we go through this in the United States, there's a very anti-reactionary um, standpoint. So where conservatives are really grappling um, with methods to try to re-oppress folks, I think you know, the conversation about what does it mean to talk about critical theories around race. What does it mean to talk about voter suppression? So all of these things, if you if you have an opportunity to really delve deeper into the book chapters, I think that's a highlight um, of what this book, book is about to do for, for the readers. So to that end, Dr. Coakley, um, would you just share with um, the audience, maybe again, some of your, your understanding of uh, anti-Blackness and where you see this edited series um, in terms of helping people for strategies uh, to overcome oppression. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Dr. Wright. And you know, and I, I want to be clear that that when I when I highlighted the op-ed by Dr. Ross and in, in her sort of um, discussing anti-blackness, the idea of anti-blackness long preceded Dr. Ross's contribution in the New York Times. Um, black scholars have been talking about anti-blackness for for many many years. So I just want to make sure that. <laughs> that that people understand that, um, you know, for me, you know, it's it's important also to to reemphasize the point that we're not just sort of talking about racism. You know, racism is is an easy word to you know that that people sort of throw around and and you know and it's you know applicable obviously to people from diverse um, groups and backgrounds. Some people sort of think of it as a, a form of xenophobia, you know, where people just have a general dislike or prejudice against people who are different. Um, and and so I, I think that that it's important to to drive home the point that that when we're talking about anti-blackness, you know, we're talking about a an experience um, that goes well beyond general generic notions of 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 racism, um, the examples that you heard from the chapters, and you know, and I, I don't want to overstate the point, and you know, and, and certainly I, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think that I am. But the examples that you've heard um, from the contributors, and and others that we highlight in the book, 
really speak to a, a disgust for the existence of black people. You know, we're not talking about just, you know, uh, you know, the fear of the other. We're not talking about just, I don't like you just because it's, it's, it's literally a disgust for our existence as black people. And this disgust, this disregard, this disdain manifests itself in every aspect of our lived experience. And so to me, that goes beyond any idea that one might have of what racism might mean, um, because it's so, it's so pronounced, it's so pervasive, it, it, it goes beyond any, any notion of, of, of what we think we understand racism to be. And so, so, so to articulate anti-Black racism, anti-Blackness as it manifests itself against Black people, it's important to talk about that. And, and, I'm, and let me say this, I mean, I, maybe I don't have to say it for the audience that I'm speaking to, but you know, I'm not talking about an oppression Olympics. You know, I'm not trying to say that you know, the oppression of Black people is greater than any other group of people. That, that's not where I'm going. But what I am saying is, is that, that the oppression that Black people have experienced is, is unique in some ways and in ways that, that, that need to be articulated, that need to be highlighted, that need to be understood, and most importantly, that need to be combated. Um, and and so, so what we wanted to do in the book was not just identify those, the ways in which anti-Blackness has manifested. I think we're all fairly familiar with that, but, but most importantly, you know, offer some, some suggestions, some solutions, some recommendations about how we might be able to com ultimately combat and eradicate anti-Blackness wherever um, it, it manifests. Thank you, Dr. Coakley. Um, I see some questions that actually relate to what you just said. Um, and so let me see here. Crystal Grimes asked if any available resources to confront a school or school system exist um, concerning anti-Blackness. And that may be Dr. Coakley, Annika, you may talk a little bit about um, some of the available resources, either personally or through IEFRA. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's a great question. We have a lot of resources through IEFRA, um, whether it's our policy briefs or other articles, research. Um, but I will point you to, as well, Texas Appleseed. I mean, this is going to be geared towards Texas, but Texas Appleseed does a lot of work in this, in this realm, right? And whether it's providing resources, whether it's providing research and reports, or whether it's, you know, more of the legal side of things. Texas Appleseed does a lot of good work. Um, and Dr. Wright, I'm sure you could speak to this as well, having worked in the education system for so long. Um, I think too, at least Ricky and I and Tracy and, and Iupra, we've really worked closely with the equity office, right? So if that's a part of the school district, that is a great resource. Um, and, a, and a great option. We've developed a very close relationship with our equity office, both at the city level and, and at the school district level. So I think equity offices at, at, any, at any level, whether it's government or school, um, is, is crucial. Thank you, Annika. Yeah, um, Ricky, you said something earlier, you, because of your book chapter giving this diasporic kind of global perspective. You and I have talked about this in, in the past, but I wonder if you could say something about, um, you know, what I'm calling like anti-Blackness as a global export, right? This idea that whatever is happening in the United States, we see that mirroring in other countries and the impact it may have on both native born and immigrant Blacks who come to the United States. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's interesting because um, both of my parents, um, as you know, Dr. Wright, both my parents are from Panama, and my father has told me significantly about uh, some of the experiences he's had um, living in the Canal Zone, which was a territory of the U.S. Uh, government. And just thinking about the racially disparate experiences that he uh, endured in that space and how transferable that experience is to the United States makes me think about what are some possible solutions of addressing it. And it's really complicated because you know, even just thinking about the United States, you had explicit policies that explicitly called out Black people 
that ex explicitly found a way to uh, talk about how black people shouldn't live in certain areas or black people, um, you know, just thinking about segregation to restricted, restrictive covenants. Um, so, you know, just thinking about the generational effect of, of, of that, how do you really find yourself, how do you get outside of that box if you don't have policies that explicitly address black people is, is the thing that I'm thinking about. You know, it's difficult because if you have policies that explicitly address black people to put them inside of a box, and then you just say, okay, now we're gonna start off with a clean slate without trying to come up with policies that talk about these things um, and, and try to get them to, to have greater access or whatnot. It, it just becomes a difficult situation. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question or whatnot, but that, that's some of the things that I was that I was thinking about when you had asked that when you had asked that question. Just thinking about those those things. No, it's, it's really helpful, Ricky. And as you know, with, with IUPRA, the institute that we work for and, and that Dr. Cookley has really led um, for the last six to seven years, uh, often people will ask us, you know, what's up with the mission statement? Why are you talking about this notion of anti-Blackness? Um, and why are you pivoting specifically on Black people? And so the short answer is the way of Black people tends to be the way of civil rights, human rights for everyone in the United States. Um, the kind of longer answer to that is that what happens in the United States has a direct impact on the global world, whether we like it or not. Um, but just as telling, as you can see with Black culture, right? I, I think about this with, with kids. You know, I'm at that age when I grew up, there was certain music and sound. I'm from Queens, New York. So all of the rap and the hip hop, <laughs> and the way we do things seems very common now. But when I was growing up, this was a very community right response. It was an art, creative, artistic response that was coming out. But what happens when that becomes lessened, right? As we don't really attribute this to blackness anymore. Instead, we attribute things like crime and violence and self-hate. And so the exporting of, of what Dr. Coakley has, you know, so aptly explained around anti-blackness is really huge because the, the question, you know, that I, I pose is why is it that in the United States we're so good and we not really including us, I'm going to say we generally, but why is it that when it comes to, to Blackness, we're so good at exporting the negative, but very, very limited in terms of giving credit to where credit is due, right? So your educational system, the framework, um, much of, I saw somebody wrote in the chat, see if I could find it back, um, but talking about, you know, really what it is, is this, this back and forth pivot. You live long enough, you start to see people kind of have this quick recognition, right? And that's really what we saw 2020 bring, was people saying, usually always led by Black people, enough is enough. And we tried to talk it out. We tried to do everything we can, you won't hit here. So that's the end. We're going we're gonna to stand up for this. And you get this brief blink, right? In this case, because of social media, the world has, has looked with us. But this is not a new struggle for Black people, both in the United States and beyond. The question then, how do you move from this one moment of recognition to long-term right solutions. And that's the piece that I think the United States and even globally has really been um, missing to one point. So again, tying it back to the book, what I love about this book, particularly in, you know, in a political scene where conservative anti-Blackness has taken on policy, right? You can't teach critical race theory, um, voter suppression, that they call voter rights, but it depends on what side of the aisle you sit on, right? Um, redistricting, gerrymandering, all these things that are really policy focused to make sure you can't even speak about the experiences that you're going to. And so I asked Dr. Coakley and the, and the authors, the chapter contributors to talk about how this book situates. How, do we, how does this book serve as a recentering of that conversation? You may not talk about critical race theory, and I'll argue that most people don't really understand what critical race theory is about, uh, they hear critical and they hear race, and they don't get that it's a critical analysis of the way race is experienced in this country, not an anti-whiteness. Um, but that being said, I saw someone had a question. Oh, actually, this is, this is good. Michelle Selman Fisher says, the appropriation of Black culture is the norm. And that is true. I would agree with that. Um, and I think probably many people on this would, would also agree. There was a question I, before I turn it over to more um, audience interaction, if we have it, Alex Porter um, makes a comment about necessary research in the face of CRT, which is critical race theory opposition. How can this vital research be disseminated? Um, I think that's a good question. And I, I you know, ask 
Dr. Lowe, Dean Lowe, um, particularly in your new position as Dean of Research, how do you see the work from this book playing into the role that you have, particularly at the university level? It plays in a lot of levels because I Dallas College is in Dallas and a lot of, when we talk about our black students, a lot of them are coming from the Southern Crescent. So the areas that where housing discrimination has happened and you have the lack of resources and education and they're pooling into our college systems under-resourced also. And so these, the anti-blackness, it doesn't stop at the doors of the college, you know, and we, we do a lot to make sure that we have diversity and inclusion conversations, but it's just really, really critical, especially in the research that I do for each of the student populations to pinpoint what those nuances are. And I think when we talk about our research and our data at the community college level, it's like, well, let's disaggregate this data. Let's get to the root of what the differences are between populations and what are the differences between how they're experiencing the same situation, but impacted in different ways. And so understanding the anti-Blackness role, anti-Blackness sentiments, especially within the college experience is important. It goes beyond that disaggregation, but looks into what is the particular experience of our Black students on campus, our Black international students. Um, so I think very much so that it's this book informs what the work we do, because it does hit on like Annika's chapter education when we talk about policing. Just because you're on a, co a community college campus, you still interact with this community very much. You still go to work. You still have to interact with the police. We have around the district office a police station that's right by us. So all of these things interact and very much impact how we um, serve our students. And again, in that research piece, I think the, the important piece is as we start to do our research and examine these experiences that we are taking into consideration constantly, especially me as a leader, what this means for our Black students. So I hope that answers your question. It does um, really well, very articulately. And, and I, I just wanna make this comment because I see that there are some of the faculty members, uh, you know, Dr. Coakley as the editor of this book has really made a pointed effort to make sure that there's a diversity of voices so that you are getting experience from both who are academically trained, trained as well as our community um, folks who are doing the work on the ground in the field. Um, but but one of the things I was going to ask, and this is really for, for Dr. Coakley, but you know, anyone else feel free to chime in. You talked a little bit about um, as you were thinking about putting this, this book together, you know, not having, and these are my words, but really not having the pressure, right? Because you are really at the top of tenure, you don't have to get any further. So you've achieved to a point where you may have the freedom to kind of take on this topic. But for those of particularly black faculty members who are really interested in working in academy, but making sure that they use that, um, use the background of social justice, blackness. And, and, you know, I hear a lot about the tenure process and what is what counts and what doesn't count. You know that so many black um, academics are doing community work. They're doing the work, the service work. Could you talk a little bit about um, how you see this connection between the academic research, doing work like this, um, and what it means to the Black community. Yeah, no, th thank you for the question, Dr. Wright. I mean, this is th this is one of the central challenges of, of being a scholar activist, uh, particularly in this current climate. Um, and, and what you'll have is that, especially, I mean, it's not just, you know, Black folks, I mean, other, other folks as well, but, but, you know, I'll speak specifically to, to Black folks who find themselves um, on the front lines, um, you know, whether it's, you know, a more sort of intellectual form of activism or, or whether it's literally, you know, marching on the streets, that this this takes up a considerable amount of, of time and energy. Um, and, and when the activism, you know, is in, a, in the form of, of more intellectual forms. So when I think, when I talk about, you know, say public scholarship, for example, and, and, and making sure that, that people have access to the knowledge that we have in the academy, and being very sort of proactive in that, that takes time. And it is a form of knowledge production that should be validated by the university. Um, and unfortunately, we know that that's not necessarily the case. It, there have been attempts to, to, to get the university to do a better job of recognizing different forms of knowledge production as being important to the enterprise um, of, 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 of higher education. 
but it's very, very slow. And so I'm, I'm in a place of privilege because as a, as a tenured full professor, as you sort of mentioned, I have the freedom now to be able to really go out and say the things and write the things um, without fear of, you know, necessarily retribution or, or, or getting that one more promotion. I, there's no more promotions for me. I'm, you know, that, that's it for me. Uh, I would like to be able to tell people who aren't where I am, you know, professionally, that they should also be able to do that. And, and in fact, and I, I gave you one specific example. I alluded to one of the contributors um, of the activism section. Um, and this was a sister, you know, I, I'll just be, go ahead and tell you, this was a sister who was at the University of Florida. Brilliant, brilliant sister, counsel, fellow counsel psychologist. Um, had, has already started her career, um, you know, sort of, you know, publishing in the top places. Um, she created a whole movement, Academics for Black Lives, um, that generated hundreds, if not thousands of people to, to stop work um, during the, you know, to, to recognize and acknowledge the pain that Black people were going through. And this was an assistant professor. Well, she was doing that work. But you know what? It, it ended up coming at a cost. Um, and for and she shared very publicly, you know, via social media platforms, some of the challenges that she was experiencing, and it led, unfortunately, to her leaving the academy um, because she could not, in good conscience, continue doing that the important social justice work, the activism that she was doing, in a space that was so invalidating and, and beyond invalidating that was that was harming her spirit. And so she made the decision, you know what, I'm going to continue this work, but outside of this space. And it's, it's a loss for us. Um, and sometimes people feel like they have to make that sort of decision. And I respect that. Uh, but I, I would hope, I would hope that, that more of us would make the decision to not leave the academy and to sort of use this space and use the resources of the space to, to fight the good fight, if you will. But it's not easy. And again, I say that from a privileged space. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Coakley. I mean, I, I, I wanted to ask that specifically about faculty. I also know we've got like Dr. Jennifer Wilkes um, <clears throat> who's on the call as well. I see some other faculty members, but I also have been thinking about that in terms of the experience of, of our alumni. That's what I call folks who have done really great work with a IUPRA, the Institute and have gone on. And so, you know, Dean Lowe and I've had this conversation a lot about the, just the inordinate amount of work um, that all people of color, but black people, and then even to an extent, black females are constantly asked to do sitting on committee works, uh, mentoring, assigning, we do the writing, um, but then the recognition that it takes and how sometimes you actually have to go outside of your home institute just to get the recognition for the work that you've been doing all along. So, you know, for me, like I said, going back and looking at, at your book, um, what really excited me is that this is a way of just kind of handing off and saying, take a look at this chapter and let's talk, have a conversation about what it is that Black people are experiencing individually but collectively all along and then what's your role in this? How are you going to help? So, um, yeah, I, I thank you. And for those of you who haven't yet picked up the book, um, I know there's a link in the, um, somewhere in the chat that's going to give you directions for how you can access it. It is free, as far as I know. <laughs> don't want to do a false pitch. Um, and it's a really great read. Thank you, Christina. Christina B has done that, put that in the chat for us. So make sure you, you definitely check it out. Share it with friends, those who couldn't be on um, today. You want to share it as a real strong resource. And if those of you who are working in K-12 system in particular, in particular, where there's there's really this kind of conversation about what you can and can't talk about, this is a great way to invite teachers, your principal, other parents, particularly if you're in non-Black spaces. Um, this is a great resource for all of you. So with that being said, I know we have a, a few more questions in the chat. We've got the IUPRA link um, is in the chat, so feel free to reach out to the IUPRA team, also Dr. Coakley, who you can just Google him, and he's all over the place, so you'll be able to find it. Um, but I want to go ahead and turn it over back to Dr. Wilkes. Thank you, Dr. Wright. And thank you um, to Dr. Coakley, Annika Olson, um, Dr. Tracy Lowe, Ricardo Lowe, um, for sharing um, insights from your chapters. And I just want to reiterate that this book is available as a free 
um, electronic book, an ebook. Um, so please make your way to the Cognello website if you would like to know more about these contributions and the many other important contributions that the volume includes. I'd like to thank our guests um, also um, for taking time to join the conversation and uh, enrich it through the chat. Um, please do visit the IUPRA website, the Warfield Center website um, for more information about our activities. We hope that if this is the first time that you are joining us, it will not be the last. We like to say that every day is Black History Month um, in Black Studies at UT Austin. So we will have a range of events, range of events, um, not only through the end of February, um, but uh, on to the end of the spring semester. And of course, uh, we'll start things back up with the next academic year. Um, so that is all. Again, thank you so much, everyone. And please take care. Bye.